Hello, church family. Uh, this song is by a lady named Joyce Reba Luttrell. And uh, she gave us over 2,500 gospel songs. So you're asking yourself, why have I never heard of this woman? <laughs> she was better known as Dottie Rambo. <laughs> on part two of our sermon series, um, Holding a Piece of God's Puzzle. First Kings, 17th chapter. Over the years, I have developed a relationship with a professional tennis coach. His name is Wayne Bryant. And Coach Bryant, he has two sons, Bob and Mike, and they just happen to be the all-time winning as doubles players in the history of tennis. They're Hall of Famers. They just retired this last year. Um, when there was, uh, uh, when the uh, Bryan brothers, is what they're called, 
You've seen them on television commercials and those kind of things. Uh, as, as the Bryan brothers were going to have an exhibition in Midland um, a while back, the, uh, I found out about it, so I emailed uh, Coach Bryant and I said, are you, you going to come to, to see the boys in Midland? He said, I'll be there. And I said, great. Uh, Jason, I went there early, and uh, so I could talk to him before the thing started, and we visited uh, a bit. And so uh, they, there was a couple of pros. In addition to them, there was also Ryan Harrison was there. He's a, he's a, a Grand Slam winner in tennis pro as well, as well as Marty Fish, uh, Olympic silver medalist. And they have these professional tennis players and all these kids in the stands, and everybody's excited. And uh, uh, so they, as they were, as Coach Bryant was emceeing and he was introducing all the, these pro tennis players, and of course all the kids were going crazy and stuff, and and, uh, and they needed a little help. So they said, Coach Jimmy Crawford, come on out here. Well, I went out, and uh, I just had a, a tennis sweatsuit on or whatever. It kind of looked the part, I guess. But uh, when it came time for the kids to go and uh, uh, to to go to the different tennis pros. Some of the kids ran to me, and I was like, I'm not the tennis pro, I don't know why you're coming over here, go over there, including my own son came to me. <laughs> and I'm like, Jace, what are you doing? <laughs> you can hit with me anytime you want to, <laughs> go over there. And so, uh, but anyways, uh, as, as we were playing the different drills and did the different things and stuff, and uh, uh, Marty Fish is, um, it, Pro Marty Fish, he, he, he and his team got out first, and when his team got out, he came over and joined my group. And as he joined my group, I'm gonna, I'm trying to step out because I'm not the tennis pro. I was trying to separate myself, distance myself from them because my talent is not even anywhere close to where they're at. And and uh, and, and Marty just said, no, 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 stay here. So he had me stay in the, in the group. And I tried to distance myself as much as I could from these professional tennis players. After all, they're Grand Slam champions, silver medalists in the Olympics. And uh, as I tried to distance myself from them, uh, I began to think about things. Whenever I got back into the stands, because I helped them out for a little while, and I kind of went and kind of got myself away, and I understood there that uh, although that I was not like them as far as the, as far as a tennis level is concerned, I'm not that distant from them because I have a human nature just like them. You see, whenever we read renowned people of faith in Scripture, we try to distance ourselves sometimes away from them. Whenever we read about here the prophet Elijah, sometimes we try to, to distance ourselves from Elijah, because after all, he's found in the Hall of Faith, found in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. But we must remember James 5, I guess verse 16 or so, 15 or 16. And the statement says this, is that, uh, uh, that, that James calls Elijah a man with a nature like ours. In other words, he was a man like us. He was a person like us. We can relate to him. We can look to him. Elijah is just like us, and we should seek out to be just like him. Standing bold face, bold in the face of, of opposition, praying to God to act on his word, and praying that God's glory will be known through us and that people will come to repentant faith to Jesus Christ. So when we look at Elijah, Elijah was a man, a man of faith. We can't distance ourselves from that because you, if you're a person of faith, are just like the renowned prophets of old. The renowned people of faith of old. This morning as we open up the scriptures and we learn a little bit more about Elijah, as we continue on with our sermon series. We understand that last week, uh, last week when we jumped into it, we understood that, that, uh, that Elijah, what did he do? He, he, uh, he burst onto the scene to confront King Ahab. The Bible calls King Ahab the, the most horrendous king, the, the worst, most evil king that there was. In 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, 
Whenever we pick up here the story here, uh, let's kind of continue on here in 1 Kings 17 chapter. Uh, we see here, we read the scripture that says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead. Can anybody tell me where Tishbe's at? <coughs> Good, because if you, if you said yes, let me tell you exactly where it's at, then you would know more than all the other theologians that are out there because they kind of know about area or region. But no one really is for sure where Tishbe's at. So I just wanted to, to check your your, uh, your your level of faith there. Some of us may have said, well, Brother Jimmy, I could tell you exactly where that's at. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so it says here, now Elijah the Tishbe, uh, uh, Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Remember, Elijah. What does Elijah like? His name mean? My God is Yahweh. Elijah boldly confronted the king Ahab. King Ahab, what was he doing? He was loosely leading the kingdom to God. What I, what I mean by that? Well, he, he, was, uh, he knew that the, the God of his ancestors were very, very important in the land. He knew that uh, in his ancestors, that, that uh, uh, for the city, not the only one that wrestles with this thing. <laughs> I think a new microphone, I guess. But he also, as when he's looking in here, he, he, uh, he understands here in Scripture that, that, that uh, Ahab, you know, he was following God, not really, but kind of paying lip service to God. He was going through the motions and he allowed him, his wife Jezebel, who was the, uh, uh, from Phoenicia, and her, the, she was, uh, uh, her dad was, remember, we talked about it last week, her dad was a, the chief priest and a, and a king of the land that, that worshipped Bel, the pagan god. And, and here it is that, uh, that, that she was promoting the, uh, the, the false worship of Bel in the land of Israel. And the people that were supposed to be God's people, God's chosen people, the Israelites, they were, in fact, polytheistic, meaning that they now worship multiple gods. Well, we know that that's kind of an oxymoron because we know that there's only one God. However, when we put this into understanding, we will understand a little bit more about how even today we do the same thing. Elijah, what did he do? When he went up and attacked... King Ahab, and he says, hey, not going to rain. No dew, no rain, no nothing. Do you realize that this hit Bell at its very core? Bell was known as the rider of the clouds, the storm god, the one that controlled rain and the crops. In contrast here, God is, is saying, Elijah is saying that God alone is the one that gives life and death. God alone is the one that contains, uh, that controls the rain and the fertility of the land. Bell's followers, what they believe, they believe that uh, that Bell would, would die and be restored after the summer, and the rains, the fertility, and the crops, and and those kind of things would would grow a little bit more and more and more. This culture that Ahab had grown in the kingdom, the same culture that that uh, that the, the the prophet here Elijah is trying to to to, to refute, was a polyist, polytheistic culture. People want a little bit of everything, a little bit of goddesses of worship, a little bit of Baal worship, a little bit of Yahweh worship. A little bit of everything. When we look at that and put that in today's time in 2022, we live in a similar time. People want to worship a little bit of everything, but not live for God exclusively today. Well, I'll, I'll take a little bit of God, a little bit of horoscopes, a little bit of nature, naturistic things, a little bit of K-love, a little bit of pop psychology, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You see, people want God on their deathbed, but they live every day otherwise. As a result of this twisted theology, 
immorality is normal today. Just like it was back in the day here of Ahab and Elijah. If you look at the time here, you look at the day, his day was exactly like ours, where people called good, uh, uh, evil good, and, and uh, 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 good evil. Just look at this last week's Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. If you listen to people on the news and people on social media, uh, you would infer that saving a child's life was a bad thing. You would infer by listening to multiple people on social media and on the news that, uh, that somehow to be able to kill a child in the womb would be a good thing. I don't get it. Society, society back that Ahab was running in his time frame, I'd submit to you is exactly kind of like what we have right going on just right now. That's right. Much like the world that Elijah lived in is what's going on right now. What did Elijah do? Let's continue on verse 2 here. When the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kidrith Ravine, east of the Jordan. Elijah lived under God's authority, uh, an authoritative word, whether he was obeying it or proclaiming it. Elijah was to leave the area and hide in the Kirith Ravine. It's an isolated area. He'd be protected by the, from the wrath of Ahab and Jezebel. And it would also serve as a place of preparation for Elijah. Verse 4. You will drink from the brook. I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. This, I think it's going to be the, the raven on the next slide, I think. That raven is taken, that, as a picture, was taking place pretty close to the area that we're reading about right now. And he was eating, like if you look at there, look what he's eating. Mm -hmm. He's eating a little piece of bread. Mm -hmm. When I saw that picture, I mean, when I saw that happening right before my very eyes, I was like, I gotta get a picture of this. Now I'm not gonna tell you, it took me five tries to get this picture right here. <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you that part, but it did. But you see that. That raven, it's not like the ravens we have here. You see, it's gray and black in nature. And they're much bigger than they are here. As a matter of fact, Jay said, it was either Jason or Christian said, man, these things are about as big as, as uh, eagles. They're massive there. And the picture doesn't do it uh, justice, but they are huge birds. But you see, very interesting. I thought this, when I saw this, that's what I thought of this very scripture. This bird's eating bread. The bird is eating bread, which goes along directly with the scripture. As I was saw this with my very eyes, the words of the page, as a brother said uh, to me the, the other day, uh, it, it, when I was there walking in the Holy Land, it makes the Bible 3D. It jumps out at you. When I saw this, I thought, oh my goodness gracious, this is exactly what I've been reading for all these years. Elijah, here, Elijah, the word of the Lord came to him. Leave here and go and hide in the Kirith Ravine. You'll drink from the, the wadi or the brook that I have directed you, uh, to, and then directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Now let's put this into perspective. We've got to understand this. And I, Whenever we were there going through this, at uh, this very area, and I was looking at these wadis, these ravines, we need to understand that these wadis or these ravines, they only flow during rainy seasons. In Israel, there's no such thing as a rainy season. As a matter of fact, a tour guide said that it rains probably about three times a year there. It's very, very rare that it rains in these areas. So talk about faith. You see, Elijah was told to go down to this ravine that you're going to drink from the brook and that I have directed you and that, and that ravens are going to supply you with food. Ravens. You know, first of all, first things first here, that, that he was going to drink from the wadi or from the brook. 
Didn't God just say that, hey, everything's fixing to dry up? About three and a half years, we read in the New Testament about how it, it was dry, it dried up. So talk about faith. Next, ravens are going to feed you? You realize that ravens, they don't even typically feed their young. They're notorious for that. But ravens, also unclean animal, is going to be feeding Elijah? That's going to be a source of food? That's exactly what took place. Elijah, what did he do? He was holding a piece of God's puzzle. Well, Elijah, praise God, he followed instructions. And he was obedient. And he went to the place where God wanted him to be. Ladies and gentlemen, I think there's a definite message there for us as well that that, that when we when things doesn't seem like it's going right for, for us, it was like, hey, wait a minute. You want me to do this? You want me to do that? That's scary. I, I, I'm not down with that. I don't want to do that. Whenever, uh, whenever I, I, I told you guys this story before, whenever I was um, worked in the telecommunications business and things, and I was praying that, uh, that I felt like God was going to want me to do something different after that. And, and this, this whole teaching thing uh, kept popping up. And this teaching thing that popped up, I was like, wait a minute here, I, I don't want to be a teacher. My wife was a teacher. She just started. I don't want to be a teacher. I got a business degree after all. I, I, I'm supposed to be making a lot more money than teachers. God, don't you understand this? And that's exactly what I was like, was going through, was doing. Well, at that same time, I, I committed to a year's worth of prayer. And at that, towards that year, God was closing the door that I was in and was opening other doors. But it was scary. Very scary. It's like, wait a minute here. I, I don't know what the world's going on. It was so scary that that whenever, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, whenever I had uh, felt like that I was going to do something different, I needed to get into to, to, uh, the teaching aspect. As the doors continued to open up for me, then as the doors opened up, well, Jace Caleb here was born about that same time. As a matter of fact, he came a little early. Praise God, because my insurance was going to run out that next month. God provides. Now, me and myself, I, I, I like, hey, look, I got, a, I got a wife. I got two kids, one on the way, that decided to make an appearance, a little early entrance. Perfect. And then as this was all happening, as I was changing professions and, and leaving a job making a lot more money than, than school teachers did. As a matter of fact, when I got in to be a, a, a school teacher, that, uh, because I had to, uh, to make less money because uh, I wasn't certified. I had a degree, but I wasn't certified. I had to go through all the, jump through all the hoops to, to do all that stuff, but I won't bore you with that. But anyways, so they don't pay you as much. Well, back in the day, back in, you know, 2000, 2001, it's not like that they, you know, teachers are not knocking down the door of the bank to cash their check all the time, right? Yeah. So talk about faith. God had allowed, that God had showed me, God had guided me to a place that God needed me and wanted me. And it was difficult for me to do. Because all of the things were pointing otherwise. Friends and family says, you are nuts. True story. My wife stuck by me 100%. Never, ever question. Said, if that's what God wants you to do, we got to do that. And as I went into that, and I already had resigned because I, I, I didn't understand how the process of the school works. I didn't understand how it's a little, you have to jump through tons of red tape. Those of you guys that work for the school, you understand what that is. Uh, but you have to go through a lot of red tape to get there. I was on, on somebody's word that they were going to hire me. I went ahead and resigned, gave my 30 days notice. And then uh, about, in that 30 days, whenever he was born, four days before my last day at my job, I didn't have a job. I had left that job, didn't have a job, and was scared because here I is, here I am with a brand new mouth to feed, two other kids, a wife, Lord, <laughs> you said you're going to show up, but right now I, I am jobless. Mm -hmm. Scary. But, just like God always does, when we are obedient, we may go through some scary times in our lives. Mm -hmm. 
things that does not make sense in our own minds. But when God is in control, He takes you where you need to be. Amen? That's right. I guarantee you that. I, I, I'm living proof of that. And many of you today, you can testify right now that same thing about how, about how you have gone through situations, how God has brought you through situations, whether it be financial struggles, whether it be family struggles, whether it be uh, job struggles, whether it be health scares, whether it be whatever the case may be, death of loved ones, and so on and so forth. You have God, you, you can look at it and you're like, I don't understand how I'm going to get there. I don't understand. You're telling me, God, you want me to go and do this? I don't understand that, God. That's exactly what I'm sure Elijah was thinking. Elijah's like, wait a minute here. I, had to, I went up here to, to Ahab, the mighty king, and I got to his face and said, you better, you better knock it off because this is what's going on. Because you have led the land wrong, God's people wrong, that all the, the things are going to dry up. There's going to be any rain uh, and nothing like that for years to come until, until God's word shows up. And God of Baal, if Baal's uh, almighty God, then let him take care of the thing. And all he's done is he's inserted himself on the scene. Why? Because he was part of God's puzzle. God had a divine appointment for him and he was obedient. And then eventually lives were changed as a result of that. You see, God puts you in a place where you need to be, a piece of God's puzzle where you need to be. And if you are obedient, then allow yourself to be placed down, your little puzzle piece placed down in that puzzle. It makes that puzzle piece, it makes that puzzle whole. You may not look at that little small puzzle piece and say, I don't get the big picture. There's no way that if I brought a puzzle piece in here, and I should have done it, bring a, take a puzzle in here and bring one piece and show you one piece and say, tell me what this is supposed to be. You have no clue. You can't tell that off of one uh, piece of the puzzle. Can't do it. But if we all come together with our pieces, hmm, that a preacher right there. We all come together with our pieces and we start binding them together in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, Amen putting that together, then what happens? You see the picture. And, he, and it may not be where, where this picture over here, is, this piece of the puzzle may not be there right now. It may take weeks, it months, years for that piece of the puzzle to get there. Whenever God's timing is, God's timing is perfect, it's true. It's still, God's timing is perfect, amen? And so when that piece of the puzzle gets there and it's like, okay, I see that. And sometimes you may not be the one to see it. Maybe your children or your grandchildren to see it. But when you are obedient with God, God will respect that and honor that. And you are part of God's puzzle piece. You're God of God, part of God's life. If you put your hand yourself in the hand of God, you've got to be obedient. There's no other discounted way to do that. Elijah... A man's here, he's like, okay, I'm going to go out to, 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 to this brook and I'm going to be fed by, by, by ravens. I'm going to drink water from this brook. He, he was holding a piece of God's puzzle and he was obedient. He, he was placing it where God wanted him to be. Verse 5. So he did what the Lord told him to do. Isn't that amazing? Ladies and gentlemen, if that had been you and I, you would have said, Lord, that's that. is that really you telling me to do that? Let me go ask 250 other people and pray for me. Let me call the church and we'll pray for it. We've got to get everybody on board, plus the people that I know that's in this camp that's going to either point me this direction or that direction. Let me call those folks first. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes when God gives you a word, that's between you and God. That's between you and God. God's the one that talks to you directly. God talks to you as well as he talks to me, as well as he talks to Billy Graham or Greg or anybody else. Billy Graham's dead, obviously. But you know what I'm talking about. God speaks. God's speaking to Billy Graham pretty loud right now. <laughs> Verse 5, so he did what the Lord told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. You see, the Lord provided for
for Elijah's safety from Ahab. The Lord provided food and water for Elijah. What did Elijah do? Elijah obeyed. When Elijah obeyed, he witnessed the power of God. But I want you to notice something here. As we dig a little a bit deeper. Notice how the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and the evening. Notice how God just didn't give him an abundance of animals to eat. God didn't say, hey, okay, you go out here and, and you got this water and stuff. And so, hey, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring some cows and some, some goats and some chickens. And, and you're going to have a little farm out there and I'm going to take care of you. You're going to have an abundance of, of, of things to eat. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm, when you get there, I'm going to have a couple of 50-pound sacks of flour there. And I'm going to have some, some vats of oil in there and some olive oil and everything like that. I'm going to have it all set up for you. You just move in and life's going to be good. Good. That's not what happened. What happened was, was God provided in the morning and in the evening. Why? Good question. I'm glad you asked. That's because Elijah had to rely upon the provider instead of the provision. You and I, ladies and gentlemen, must rely upon the provider instead of the provisions. It's pretty deep right there. That's a word that we need to hear right there. Verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. We talked about this earlier. Talk about the, the, another challenge to Elijah's faith. But did you get it? Did you understand what took place right here? <clears throat> Again, in verse 7. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Do you get the irony here? God was answering Elijah's prayer that he prayed that there would be no rain or dew in the land. And Elijah was experiencing the consequences of his own prayer being answered. Let that one sink in. He prayed this prayer. God answered the prayer. And because of that prayer, He's now facing the consequences of the prayer that he gave that God answered. Wow. So sometimes when you and I go through heartaches, pain, turmoil, and despair, and all these kind of things, and we say, Lord, just clear it up. Have you ever thought that God has you there for a purpose? Have you ever thought that maybe you're there because God has answered your prayer before? And you're there now? That's pretty intense. Think about that one. And you could chew on that for the next week. So God answered Elijah's prayer, which caused the brook to dry up, which caused him not to have any water. Hmm. Then what happens? As my brother Carmen, on the, uh, the Carmen, the, uh, the Carmen the Christian singer, singer, and then what happens? He was awesome. Let's continue on here. The next divine instruction was even more remarkable than the first. Verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. Zarephath, we know, is about eight miles south of Zedon. Uh, uh, it's uh, Sidon. It's, uh, it's a region. If we get this, so... It's a region where Jezebel's father, Ethbel, ruled. You get that? So God said to him to go down to Sidon. Sidon was the heartland of Baal worship. And Jezebel, the very one that's trying to kill him, her daddy was the one that ruled that area. Now, when you're putting this into context, you're like, oh, wait a minute here. Talk about a faith exercise, yeah. Remember, Elijah was holding a piece of God's puzzle. What would he do? Verse 10. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. 
Now check this out. I, I love this. I call these divine appointments all of the time. Whenever God places people right at the exact same time where it's supposed to be and God's lined things up at the exact same time where it's supposed to be, these divine appointments, that's good stuff. So, you know, look at this. If Elijah would have done anything different, if he would have taken a different route, because remember, there's not exactly like paved roads there. They did have roads that was, uh, uh, you know, they had carved out and earth you know, walked on enough times where it turned into a road and that kind of stuff. But if he would have done anything, if he had tied his shoes a little bit more, right? If he had to do anything else a little bit more, uh, then, 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 then he wouldn't be there at that exact same time. I just said tied my shoes and Jason laughed at me. He's tied sandals. Is that better? Uh, yeah. I mean, I was walking on some, walking, dusting the sandals off, whatever. You get the meaning what I'm talking about. Anything else that had taken him away, if that raven would have brought him a little bit more loaf of bread, or brought him a piece of bread like from Red Lobster, those little cheese biscuits, they're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you got, some of you guys didn't know that what I'm talking about. You can appreciate that. But if anything else would have happened, they wouldn't be there. But they, they, they exact right time that God had appointed that divine appointment. That's exactly what take pl took place here. And verse 10 says this. So he went to Reserve and he came to the town gate. A widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little bit of water in a jar so I may have a drink? Elijah, he obeyed God and he went. When he got to the town, he sees a widow there. Well, how does he know he's a widow? She's a widow. Well, back in those times, they had to wear, widows wore a, uh, a black dress. It was like a characteristic of, of mourning, right? So a black dress. And she was gathering sticks. Now, this was hardly a person with significant resources. Remember, widows, the only way they got money is if people had mercy upon them and gave them things. So hardly the person that you would go to when you're in this situation, this predicament, and the widow understood maybe a little bit of the situation. I think that she was puzzled. But Elijah recognized her as a widow that God had instructed him to meet. And I'd submit to you this. The widow was holding a piece of God's puzzle. What was she going to do? Glad you asked. Let's read verse 11. As she was going to get it, he called. And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little, over, uh, a, a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son and that we may eat it and die. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the land. Elijah you get this? Elijah trusted God. The widow had to trust what Elijah was telling her. Therefore, she had to trust Elijah, which in turn, Elijah trusted God. They were both holding a piece of God's puzzle because of their divine appointment that day. Verse 15. She went away and did as Elijah told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping of the word the Lord had spoken to Elijah. You see, something about Elijah stirred remarkable faith in the widow. She had been called to risk her last meal on the promise of this foreign God that she really didn't probably understand. But as a result of her obedience, she experienced God's supernatural provision. Not just on 
that occasion, but for an extended period of time. Understand here when we dig a little deeper that there's no suggestion that the Lord ever allowed her provisions to be stored up in advance. Just like Elijah. In other words, God didn't automatically give her, again, the 50 pound sacks of, of flour and a barrel of oil. If he did that, then some people might use that as being the prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel at all. Instead, God was, keyword here, consistently faithful. God was consistently faithful. Meeting her jar, uh, meeting her need, just in time every day. That's a God we serve, isn't it? Yeah. Amen, Bethel? Amen. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the widow and her son, her son were also forced to rely upon the provider, <laughs> not the provision. In the process, God revealed that He alone not Bell, but he alone is God. You see, when we go through life and we understand that these situations are going forth in our life, I guarantee you when you look at this Elijah, when he, he, he didn't have all this stuff in mind, but he knew this. He knew what Paul talks about. Actually, Luke talks about it in the New Testament. God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. He knew the one true living God never fails. Even when life gets really hard and really rough and it seems like it's failing around you. Elijah, I'm sure, he goes through despairs, and we're going to read about that in the coming weeks. He goes through despairs, but he knows this. God never fails. God always provides. And something interesting in the story here is, and I think that I want us to focus in on, is God is constantly faithful. You see, God provided for Elijah morning and evening. Morning and evening. What is that telling us? That tells us that Elijah's day was filled with a holy God. <coughs> He worshiped a holy God not just on Sundays, not when it's convenient for him, but he worshiped a holy God constantly. The woman, the woman had no idea either what this, this God, this foreign God was about. But because of Elijah, and, uh, and she then understood and her eyes were open about the true living God. You see, God is constant. He's faithful and he's true. And he loves you and me. We must be obedient to this constant God as we live our lives every day. Exactly like Elijah, standing up for the word of God. Not beating people over the head with the word of God. Showing people in love but while standing up for the truth. We must stand up for the truth. If you and I don't stand up for the truth, who will? We are the hands and feet of Jesus here on this earth. We have to be obedient so others and the generation after us, your kids, your grandkids, your great, great, great can grandkids, if the Lord doesn't come for all of that, can know God by you planting seeds in the lives of your family and friends and people you don't even know. You and I have a divine appointment with people. Amen? Mm -hmm. And it's up to us to be obedient. This morning, let's stand. Fancy he comes to, to play. I just want to pray. I want you to pray and ask God to place me upon your heart. That you need to talk to. Some ask God to, to place somebody upon your heart that you need to, to visit with. If you're here this morning and you've been straight away from God, 
let today today be the day you come back to God. God is always constant. He's always true. He's always faithful. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, make today be that day you give your life to God. It may be Bethel Baptist Church or whatever you call church home. As your decision is between you and God, I'm also mindful of what God says, what Jesus Christ says. If you confess me before men, then I will confess you before God the Father. So if you made a profession to give your life to Jesus, come down front and not be scared to tell the world that you're a follower of Jesus. The altar is open if you need to come pray. You need to grab somebody in the congregation to come pray. But again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, have God placed something upon your heart that you need to talk to, to share the good news, the love, the grace of Jesus Christ. You pray, as Brother Don said.